Where would you like for me to go? She's got nicer jewels than mine. It's not fair. Which one is the drag queen? How are you? Very good Thank to you. see you. Where do you want me to go? Well, um, I do believe over here. Okay. That would be right. Okay. And of course we have competition tonight with Elton John in town, but he's nothing compared oh, that old to queen. Lady Bunny. <laughs> <laughs> And we had quite a wild time in Fort Lauderdale last night. Um, Lady Bunny did a show there, and uh, it was uh, a late night and a fun night. And uh, it, was, it was actually, my, my lasting impressions of Fort Lauderdale was that a lot of people with military haircuts and not <laughs> many clothes. So <laughs> I guess it fits right in there with the beefcake. So. Um, and uh, I was delighted to discover, uh, besides worshipping Lady Bunny for many years now, I won't tell you just how many. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and of course, when it was a dream come true for me to have her agree to do the forward for the book. I mean, she was my number one choice and she said yes. So these are the kinds of moments that one lives for and um, has made me enormously happy. So um, it's been a joy ride this la the last couple of days, having her in town and being able to um, uh, participate in this way. And to discover that we have the same taste in men. So <laughs> Absolutely none. <laughs> That's her husband. <laughs> and, and tonight we bring a you're bringing beef cake to the beautiful, last night Fort Lauderdale, but beautifully sedate Coral Gables. What is next? Are you going to have men in dresses here? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on, this is a proper decorum. <laughs> it's required here in Coral Gables. Oh, absolutely. I, I was just thinking the Gables is, you know, we, we, we've had We Hillary. put the gay back in Gables tonight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah. With beef cake. <laughs> Well, um, one of my, I feel like mom trying to like, you know, nudge the kid to say the funny thing they said last night, but I'll try and get away with it. Um, the wonderful, just the one little pure magical moment where the, um, the, the pharmacy calls you and leaves a message. <laughs> that is too outrageous. Um, yes. I'm not. I'm not sure if you're prepared to to give us that one little. I don't skit. have that one. I don't <laughs> memorize. Oh, you don't. Okay. Okay. Don't. Well, there you go. <laughs> um, but I do recommend you try and catch one of Lady Bunny's live shows because they uh, have to where? be where? seen to be believed. Where's, Catch where one next? Of my live shows while I'm still alive <laughs> <laughs> would be an excellent recommendation. Where next? I'm headed back to New York tomorrow after three wonderful weeks on the road. But um, and where way. have your adventures in this last this last tour taken you? Um, RuPaul's Drag Race uh, season seven just launched, so we did a ten city tour all over the country with all of the contestants performing. So that was fun. Wow, I bet you could write a book about that. No one would want to read it, but I could <laughs> write it. <laughs> well, I do recommend you read the Beefcake um, uh, forward that Lady Bunny did, because it's so brilliant. I'm now looking for my, oh, there it is, the clicker. Um, so we can look at some of the gorgeous boys. I fell in love with all four of these fellows. Um, and maybe we can dim the lights a bit. A heckler. You have a heckler. Oh, there's three. There's Pearl one Gables. in the car. There's one in the car, right? <laughs> and, and, and. Do you mind if I sit down in the Oh, room? absolutely. You, if you would like to over there or wherever you like, okay. Lady Bunny. You're, uh. Please, no touching yourselves, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> Not that sort of event. And I mean you male ladies as well. <laughs> So these chaps um, are uh, Brooklyn boys, and they just looked so juvenile, delinquent, and gorgeous, and uh, and rock and roll. So this is, you know, these these are, are extremely uh, gorgeous young men that I just, when I saw this image, I fell for madly. Um, you just want to. Jump in that those cars and take a ride. I Your think. husband's here. <laughs> <laughs> so
So, uh, but uh, actually amazing story. Uh, it's part of what I discovered along this journey of the beefcake. Um, I'll give you a little bit more on how it all came about. Wow. Um, it started uh, in part at Books and Books in, on the beach because I curated a small beefcake exhibition there a couple of years ago and it kind of led to uh, the book eventually. Um, and I actually happened to have done two other books on pinup, which uh, are Bunny Yeager's Darkroom and um, uh, Betty Page, Queen of Curves. So this is the, the third in the trilogy of books. Um, these fellows, uh, I have wonderfully uh, crocheted, um, uh, what do you call those? Uh, G-string. Uh, G-string. Well, they I've were heard. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they crocheted by, by, by someone's grandma, so I think that's quite a nice detail. And of course, these were all images that were um, created for physique magazines because, as you know, homosexu homosexuality was banned and any physical contact between men in images was banned, um, completely illegal, you could, li you could be sent to jail. So um, if you were muscle men, you could strike a classic pose such as these guys are, and they have an excuse for holding hands. Um, and of course, the other way that they got around the censors was uh, because men were allowed to be shown in combat. So that was a strong theme <laughs> in the beefcake images. This was illegal here in the United States? Absolutely. No, com it was illegal in the United States up until the mid-60s not so long ago. Um, so this is a way that they got around it. They were hugely popular magazines that uh, these photographers photographed for. Um, this is in fact one of the most famous, I'm sure you know uh, Bruce of LA quite mm -hmm. well. Not um, personally. <laughs> and um, Bruce was a, an extraordinary photographer who was a former teacher from, of, you know, middle of nowhere, I think Utah, um, and sorry anyone from New Utah, but, um, but <laughs> 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 so, and, and he just, you know, he had an eye for hustlers and, and, uh, uh, and muscle men, and he, and he did a lot of these desert scenes, um, many of them in the Cochatella area, interestingly enough. Um, here they are again in action. Love these boys. These are the Wild Brothers. I, I have to say I quite fancy them. Um, two <laughs> dreadful children. You can only imagine what it was like to be their mother. But they posed quite willingly and were apparently straight but, you know, loved the attention and loved the pocket money which they received quite generously from Bruce to do these shoots, so they, they, were, they were some of my favorites. Of course, terribly politically incorrect, which is the way that Lady and Bunny and I like it. So <laughs> <laughs> we don't mind yourself. a little red <laughs> Indian <laughs> here and there. So <laughs> he falls into the Latino men category, doesn't he? I, well, <laughs> maybe, yeah. Um, so of but course- But these were also, uh, they got past the censors by calling this art, and hence the Roman situations and the classical, the historical situations and the athletic poses. This, was, this enabled us to see scantily clad males without it being illegal porn. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and in fact, they would, they, to prove it was art, they would go so far as to bring in uh, a statue of, you know, a fake statue of a, a Michelangelo's David to prove that the naked body was in fact art. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is the kind of court case that one it can kind of marvel was being um, y sustained. So there's a kind of sadness, obviously. It's a secret history which made it very hard for me to research. And we'll talk some more about that, but let's look at the boys. Uh, <laughs> love these guys, exactly what uh, Lady Bunny was referring to. 
swords and sandals. We're still hooked on this stuff with Game of Thrones. Yeah. I mean, um, so all of, all of those Game of Thrones and whatever they are, I find them hard to watch, I'm afraid. I'd much be rather looking at the beefcake stuff, but um, it certainly falls into that whole kind of um, swords and sandals genre, which has been around forever. So this fellow actually shot by an amazing studio in New York called Champion Studios. And uh, this was a, a classic swords and sandals pose. I uh, love these boys, <laughs> love their tan and, and the oiliness. Um, they're having quite a struggle. <laughs> Lady Bunny, do you want to uh, embellish on that at all? No. <laughs> I think as little is left to the imagination. With the <laughs> Well, we have a terrific series of these images, um, which has a kind of, to make it seem a little more scholarly, mm -hmm. um, I refer to it as a kind of Edward Mybridge motion, uh, you know, movement imagery. Um, and, and they actually do succeed as that, and quite beautifully. I think this is a stunning image. Wow. Fell madly in love with, the, with, uh, with this George O'Mara guy. Um, he was a, uh, a model bodybuilder. Um, I think he was, in fact, a military man. Um, 1958 in Chicago. All natural muscle. Keep that in mind because this is a major thing about beefcake that sets it apart from all the rest. No steroids, no muscle milk. The real deal. This was hours of, of hard work in the gym spent more time in the gym than the library these lovely chaps but <laughs> <laughs> we'll take them <laughs> this guy i i you'll see a lot of him in the book and it, a crush did develop and in fact uh, my husband asbert was saying wow you know i i kind of like him too so he definitely grows on you man man woman gay or straight he's hard to resist um, has on you hard <laughs> oh, and the puns have not stopped I mean the puns uh, Lady Bunny is an excellent pun maker but but I've definitely been with the beefcake book coming up with the corniest lines and loving every minute of it so um, these two fellows again from Chris Studios in Chicago um, Amazingly contemporary. I mean, it looks like it could be shot now. They, 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 there's nothing about them that really says 1950s. So um, I thought that was quite a striking image. I mean, I, I imagine that you could potentially, maybe nowadays that chap's lovely hair would have been removed or something. But, um, but it's, it does look a strikingly uh, contemporary image. And I loved Chris Studio from Chicago. The photographer is still alive, and he's a total legend. His name is Chuck Renslow, and um, he is just the most extraordinary man. Um, he's, I think he started Mr. In, uh, Mr. International Leather World, um, which is an ongoing leather fetish um, competition that happens every year. Uh, he also happens to have started or worked at um, the first, one of the first um, kind of leather bars in Chicago called the, the, the Golden Mile or something. Um, so he's quite a character, really legendary guy. He was in, you know, th in court, he went through all sorts of trouble to pursue his art. Um, and he's still doing it. And, and in fact, I'm very proud that this book has been uh, taken into the Leather Archive and Museum in Chicago, which is one of the kind of kink museums <laughs> that I had never and would never have known about unless I'd started working on this project. Fascinating place. The, s the most extraordinary items um, find their home there either bequeathed or donated somehow from nightclubs, from fetishes, from 
dungeons around the world. It's quite an amazing place. And I look forward to actually physically visiting. But they were meticulous with their help and very um, uh, you know, great to me within, in terms of allowing the use of images and stuff. And I was proud to get Chuck on the phone. Again, another guy who is a Brooklyn boy. Um, this was all shot by a, a, a photographer who went by the name of Le, Le Demi Du. Excuse my appalling French uh, mm -hmm. accent, but um, he was a, an extraordinary studio who, whose work was completely forgotten until two amazing guys in New York uh, who, call, who by, go by the name of Big Kugels. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what that exactly is, but I think I should, uh, I'm sure when I'm older, Lady Bunny will let me know. Um, again, uh, quite uh, an interesting image. I, I did miss uh, the, the, the lower part initially. I was, I was quite taken by the whole sailor thing, and it's one of the themes in Beefcake that is an ongoing and very popular theme. Um, and, and this was shot by Champion Studios and uh, uh, clearly rather well, well um, endowed. Uh, speaking of which... Um, <laughs> you didn't this, miss that one. <laughs> And I mean, don't we just love the kind of all-American football guy? And here he is, just lounging around, and and absolutely, completely irresisti irresistibly gorgeous. Again, um, playing with all the themes of kind of masculinity and 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 jocks and heroes, and but in a in a way, sort of subverting it through. Uh, through the um, inclusion of his undergarment. Um, <laughs> uh, this, in fact, is, is a very interesting photography studio in, uh, who were based in Colorado. A super sweet guy who was probably about the most mild-mannered and, um, and kind of careful of the beefcake photographers. And they came in such a variety of uh, shapes and sizes that um, he was certainly, he was a, a mild-mannered accountant <laughs> who, um, who turned his eye to beefcake photography and worked uh, with athletes and, um, and with models and actors in Colorado. A lot of the, what he shot was in the Rocky Mountains and they're just beautiful images and always very sort of thoughtfully shot um, and in fact his family run the archive now and they they deal with they sell his work online so um, uh, I guess I guess that's our lot with the slideshow so um, I would be happy to you know put up some more chaps or <laughs> So how about some questions? Um, I could go on forever. So just fire away with questions and anything you would like to know about Beefcake. What is the biggest surprise from dealing with the audience and uh, your guest speakers or panel of experts? <laughs> Thank you. The biggest surprise? Well, you know, this actually, this show went on the road yesterday. So this is our, our, our first um, sort of one-on-one. -on -one. This is the most mild-mannered and <laughs> civilized of the events we have planned. We are doing another party in New York at, uh, at a legendary club called uh, Monster. Some of you may know Monster in the West Village, and Lady Bunny has very graciously offered to um, uh, al allow us to uh, collaborate for, for a party there where she's spinning disco classics. So what more, what more does one want in life than uh, Lady, Lady Bunny DJing disco? Oh, wow. Um, so that's going to be a whole lot of fun. And if anyone's in New York, 329, we've already, I, I've had a lot of fun with the the bar owner coming up with 
corny names for drinks and we've got a beefcake punch <laughs> and it's cheap. So <laughs> What about the audience on the internet? Oh, you know, this and this has this been live, really yeah, great. I'm 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 thanks for reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get any surprises from dealing with them? Or? Well let's see. Let's see if we get any no, um, but you haven't put it on your own show. Did you have a YouTube? Oh no, I, I don't have a YouTube. No, I'm 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 still a beginner with all of this stuff. And In this fact, someone has to take a picture of the two of us yeah. because you know um, I didn't bring a camera and oh. I don't have a selfie stick. Wow. <laughs> Lady Bunny has one. I have a camera. <laughs> oh, you have so, a selfie stick? Is that a, oh, well, a, a selfie or is that a selfie? <laughs> so well. We won't stop to pose, but please, as Let's long as as long as we get to uh, <laughs> Petra, I know that a lot of these photos were previously unseen. So how did you go about first tracking the collectors and then meeting with them and trying to convince them to let you use the photos in the book? Well, that turned out to be um, more of a complicated task than uh, originally expected uh, because I, the kind of uh, kickoff for me with Beefcake was I'd been familiar with the genre. Um, these are the kinds of things that I, autom I just am attracted to and care about, the kind of stories in the shadows. Um, and I had known about Beefcake and, and, and been aware of it and loved it, but didn't have much more knowledge other than the few books that were available. And, and all of them quite varied, you know, and, and some of them very kind of earnest, and then others just really kind of cheesy. And I thought there was definitely a need for something that was more edgy and beautiful. Um, but I was surprised by just how deep uh, I was able to go with the, uh, with the archives that I came across. And um, my very first book, La Lady Bunny, uh, Bunny Yeager, you see I've got a lot of bunnies in my life, I'm not sure what this means. But I think this Easter I'm going to sacrifice one and it'll all be over. <laughs> 3.29 is the next party. When, <laughs> when's Easter again? <laughs> right after. <laughs> but um, so the very first book I did had some beefcake in it. And interestingly enough, it was actually beefcake shot in Florida um, with an amazing uh, guy on the beach doing handstands and stuff. So that kind of s was a bit of a seed. And then when I met a collector in Miami and we put on this tiny show at Books and Books on the Beach, that was a whole uh, collection of imagery, but none of it was, had rights associated with the collection. So that was something that had to be overcome. So we um, discovered that there were a number of amazing collections. And um, the convincing went in, in multi layers. I mean, it, it certainly wasn't the same set of uh, skills that I had to use. I had a one very bizarre interaction <laughs> with a collector who referred to me in an email as a manipulative Brit. <laughs> lady, <laughs> with lady, with this. And I was like, you know. <laughs> Usually I get British. that. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, you know, it was not without its dramas, but um, it, it all turned out uh, to be, you know, we, we kind of, Thanks to the restrictions of having to get rights uh, releases on everything, we, um, we were actually able to investigate uh, photographers that we may not have found out about. Uh, and that was definitely a deciding factor, the rights issue, and a very tough one. You can imagine many of these um, photographers were secretly doing it. Um, the models were doing it for a couple bucks. Some of the models thought they were doing it for women, some, you know, it was, it was a, just a mixed bag. Um, but I did notice something interesting is that men collectors in general, when they collect stuff, they take it much more seriously than female collectors. So some of the collectors were enormously studious. This one chap was amazing because he actually had 
you know, Bruce of LA's original documents, which had meticulous notations of the day that he shot certain models, which is extraordinary. So we were able to include that kind of depth of information um, and I thought that really made it much more meaningful to people and made it more of a kind of historic document beyond its gorgeousness as eye candy. Yeah. But, but wouldn't they collect them so uh, uh, eagerly because this was really the only type of, of, of thing and there weren't very many made so they, these copies were cherished and even in New York in the 80s and 90s there was a store in the West Village, which sold these original copies of this, you know, 30, 40 years later. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I didn't say that the pages didn't all stick together, but <laughs> <laughs> they sold them. <laughs> I did not buy them. <laughs> they sold them. I really enjoy and appreciate your comedic talents, but I want to ask you a serious question. Sure. That is what you feel about the transgender community. Well, I think that uh, the transgender issue is probably one of the last taboos that society is dealing with. I think that with people like Ellen and RuPaul on television, we've come to terms with gay and drag. And now with images like Laverne Cox on Orange is the New Black, Janet Mock, successful author who also has a television show, um, I think that people are finally starting to wake up to what transsexuals are. And even though, I know this doesn't have anything to do with beefcake, um, you know, a lot no, of attention please. in the media has, has, has been placed on Bruce Jenner and his supposed transition. Now, I know that uh, the Kardashians and, and, and some of the, that they obviously exploit sex to make a lot of money and become entertainers. I do not know that by placing this question, what is Bruce doing? Is he transitioning into a woman? It certainly appears that he is. I don't know if they're going to use that as a stepping stone to make more money or to provide more entertainment, if that's your cup of tea. But I think one thing that's really great about it is that Bruce was an alpha male sports figure. So for him, he wasn't, I, mean, I know nothing about sports, but for, for Bruce, to be the hero of an entire generation that I grew up with of sports lovers who are going to be the least likely to appreciate gays, transsexuals, drag queens, know the difference between what they are. I think it's going to bring that conversation into the foreground and make them think, huh, even a guy who I worshiped as a sports hero may be unclear all that time that he was winning games about what sex he feels that he is. And that's gonna let them know that people can be born in feeling like they're a different uh, sex. Than, and it's really not that wild. It's just that it's hard for people to, you know, get used to the idea. There's a current thing uh, that some, I think Florida is pushing, that is to say that uh, trans women would need to use their birth certificate before they can use a ladies' restroom, because this is a—it's—it's—it's it's, it's, it's actually kind of, yeah. I mean, it's—it's—it's a—it's also happening. It's coming to another uh, state as well. But it's—you know—it's—it's it's gender politics. And for those who don't yet understand what transsexuals are, it's easy for them to be afraid. They're in fact using the image of a, of a, a tr supposed trans woman with a mustache exposing himself to women in the <laughs> restroom, which if you know anything about transsexuals, that's ridiculous because if you don't want to even have a penis, you're certainly not going to be exposing it to anyone. <laughs> you know, I mean, and you're certainly not going to have a mustache on purpose. I don't know about this lighting. <laughs> I'm not a, I hope that answers your question probably way too much. <laughs> No, I I'll love that. Up, yeah, <laughs> no, but I love that. And and that for me, one of the things that I so appreciate about Lady Bunny is that she has this extraordinary um, voice in terms of her political knowledge and um, cultural awareness. And and there's so much. I I think that uh, in, I I imagine that this is something you've discussed yourself. But there's a need to have some sort of um, more 
uh, besides the, the fun club stuff to mm -hmm. have you know, more of a kind of serious round table type forum for Lady Bunny's wisdom, I think. So that gets my vote, Actually, along with the wild parties. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, um, in your study of, of all these photographs, are there any men that are older than a teenager? I mean, they all seem to be so young. Right. Just right. me. <laughs> <laughs> Shh. Oh, this is on the internet? Oh, damn. <laughs> Got to change my Craigslist lad. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, they, they were young, and actually I was kind of surprised by that, and, and, um, and uh, I tended to sort of gloss over some of the images that I saw, which I found a little unsettling um, in some of the material where, um, you know, so I, I really just tried to work with, with the uh, more adult looking uh, of the models, but of course they were young and I think that's just the timeless sort of hunger um, uh, for beauty and it's and it's very often as we know associated with that sort of uh, youth and but I'm surprised by the fact that I think some of them w were, were basically lying about their age because you know that they were allowed to um, if their par if they told their parents they were doing pictures at the gym or something, and they had to get their parents to sign a moral uh, uh, a model release form, uh, according to uh, one of the memoirs I was, I was reading about Chuck R Renslow, um, some of the models would just you know forge their model releases. So um, I guess they still do that. I, I think one of the appeals about these photos is that they're a little bit silly. And the, the guys don't, they're not old enough to even know if the photos are for men or women, they just need a few bucks. And at the same time, they also aren't even old enough to know if they are gay or straight, they're motivated by money, perhaps a desire for fame. So it's, it, they've been kind of put in these silly scenarios of like, ancient Greece and, <laughs> you know, um, a cowboy and Indian. And, you know, they don't exactly know what they're doing, but I think that's part of the appeal is that it, they can, they're, they're young, kind of clueless men as filtered through the art department of some crazy older <laughs> gay men on a budget who are really <laughs> trying to masquerade <laughs> porn as art. So, <laughs> to get past the censors. So, it is an, an it, it's a heady experience, <laughs> shall we say. Well, it's that low budgetness that makes it so gorgeous. Because when you think about the, you know, the kind of high budget um, swords and sandals stuff, as far as I'm concerned, all the special effects and whatever, and the kind of money they put into it, this is far more appealing because of the restrict restriction in the budgeting. Makes people very inventive. <laughs> models were naive, your, your version of it, the photographers knew what they were doing. Did oh, yeah. The, did the photographers you, from then that you spoke to today offer any opinion on the state of pornography today, which is incredibly much more pervasive? Um, you know, uh, that's a very good question because I, I think that uh, fundamentally someone, um, and I'm just speculating, but somebody like the chap who is still around producing work who, who, who ran Chris Studios, um, I think there's a, a kind of shared interest in, in that style and um, they, as far as I know, the, you know that they didn't turn the corner with things getting really graphic. Um, so I like to refer to it as 1940s to pre-disco because as much as we love disco, when it came along, things got really raunchy. So that was really, you know, the turning point in the 70s when things um, got really graphic and pornographic. So, um, and m for most part, the photographers abandoned ship at that point because they were either getting on or they, you know, the laws were changing, so the magazines were changing. The models, I mean, uh, one of the comments is really quite funny because quite often they were shot naked just because they didn't have a budget for, you know, clothes or something. <laughs> or they'd, they'd taken a number of pictures of him when 
in that pair of shorts already. So, you know, this was the, the kind of motivation that, that, that was used. But um, I think I've probably answered it in far too complicated manner, but um, none of them, uh, to my knowledge, pursued a career, you know, in, into the 70s, because along came a lot of, like, young, hungry photographers who were much more, uh, you know, prepared to go the extra mile. And, and so one of the interviews I was reading, actually, the, the, the photographer said he got tired of, like, hitting on these guys all the time and having to convince them Me to come too. to his studio. <laughs> I can dig it. <laughs> um, and another thing that's interesting is that I remember uh, video porn from the 70s being very much prized. And I don't remember the actor's name, but maybe somebody can help me. Was it Jack Wrangler? Was he a big video star? Yes? Okay, I, 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 I'm, I, <laughs> Johnny Weir, no, <laughs> um, but you know, the, the reason, the reason that, um, you know, some of these 70 stars were so prized and some of these guys are different from more modern porn is that it was forbidden. So by the time, you know, I'm coming out and the disco days rolled around, um, gay was more okay. So the, they could use gay models who knew that they were gay, and it was, and, and these could, magazines could be sold at porn star, por, porn uh, places, you know, as porn or right along with straight porn. But there was a grittiness that caused by the fact that these guys were straight, and they and the gays had not gotten a hold of them as they did in the '80s and pluck their eyebrows <laughs> or, or shave their chest. And it was yeah. also prized that they had some body hair, which, you know, by the, by the 80s, gays decided to shun. So there was always a longing in the gay porn community, not that I'm an expert, <laughs> to, for, for the real men of the past who were not overgroomed and who were not, you know, worked out in such a specific, you know, very, you know, gay way. They were natural. Without steroids, they had a little body hair if they were old enough to grow it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was, it, so I, th I think that that's one of the reasons that these images and porn stars like Jack Brown were kind of heralded as real men from the past. And that's why these images, that's why I remember these images. And I'm really hoping um, that, and I think that this has struck a chord with enough people. I've noticed our little clip that I showed at the beginning has had a lot of views on YouTube, you know. Um, so I think there's, a, and, and the response in general has just been this huge appreciation for it. So I'm hoping it has some kind of impact on the culture. I really do, because I think it brings up a lot of important um, considerations about you know where we're heading with kind of um, this almost uh, this very severe uh, doctrine of looks and um, and I think there's a there's a huge variety of, of characters amongst the images uh, that you see in the book and it's such a pleasure not to see tattoos all over the <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. That's Very a good point. Today, even the one I'm in love with, Adam <laughs> Levine, he's got to everywhere. Any other questions? I don't like them either. We have questions. I was just curious. Um, I'm going to sit next to you. Have you met any of these models? I'm assuming yes. that maybe some of them have passed on by right now, but maybe some are still around in oh. recent years. Or have you met any of them and talked to them? Well, um, the the co the guy on the cover. I'm new on the scene, so I. The guy on the cover, he's 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 still alive, um, and he's in Canada, um, and so is the photographer. So, and in and this photographer was in fact really just um, doing it for the money. He was uh, a genuine uh, physique photographer. Was very into sports photography, and he very. 
uh, he certainly knew, you know, where his images were, were being, uh, were, were he was selling his images, obviously, um, to many of the, the physique magazines at the time. And I think one had to have known, you know, who the audience was. But um, uh, as we all do, we kind of service an industry one way or another. And there was, this was a place for publication of his images, along with, um, you know, more traditional uh, sports orientated publications so one of the the many varieties of photographers with different stories and that's what's quite hard to uh, express and I think um, I did it in the, in my introduction uh, trying to sort of place all the different characters uh, one of them was a photographer who died this last year at 92, who still wouldn't come out of the closet. And uh, he, he was, uh, seems to have been quite a grumpy chap. And he just simply didn't want to come out of the closet because he couldn't bear the culture that he was expected to participate in. And he took the most exquisite images, has this huge archive that no one can get their hands on. He's donated to some Ivy League university who, as much as I begged, would not release the images. So that's a, a very exciting project whenever his relatives, you know, come around to saying, okay, let's see what uncle was really up to <laughs> all those years in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, my meet cute story, um, I have because Lady Bunny has so many fans. So, um, but I, I was a, a fan of hers um, for probably 20 years already. And um, not that she knows, I've been stalking her for 20 years. And my stalking went so far as to um, email her a couple of times. Um, before social media, and um, I always loved what Lady Bunny posted. I was always completely uh, in awe of her political voice and very interested in what she had to say about the state of things politically. So um, for me, that was a big draw, not to mention the fact that I had seen Lady Bunny at Wigstock back in 1998 in New York on the West Side very exciting moment. The um, day I was born. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and of course, so the love affair has been uh, for... Festival, drag festival. Wigstock. Oh, Wigstock is a, a, a very important festival that Lady Bunny uh, founded. And I, I'm lucky to have gone to at least seven of them. So tell us a bit about Wigstock. Uh, it was a drag festival in New York City, and it was very much stemmed from the club scene and the many different kinds of drag that I saw in New York City that I didn't see growing up in Atlanta. Florida is a drag state known for its great drag queens, but many of them are very traditional pageant queens. And when I went to New York, I saw all kinds of drag queens singing with a band, reciting poetry, writing plays, writing forwards in books. Yeah. and. Um, so it j I thought this the, this deserves its own uh, outlet, its own showcase, bigger than the club that it was uh, put on by, the Pyramid Club. And you had Debbie Harry one year, didn't you? Stuff. I think we had her three years, yes. the goddess of rock and roll yes. herself, yeah. the Marilyn Monroe of yeah. rock and roll. Amazing. I couldn't believe it when she <laughs> was on the, my stage. Well, I've seen you, I mean, uh, if, this, if you really want to laugh out loud when you get home or any time <laughs> at all, you need a little lift, you should definitely see uh, Joan Rivers roasting Lady Bunny. It is absolutely outrageous. And I'm surprised YouTube haven't taken it down yet, but it's still there. <laughs> and it's hysterical. So, and... Joan Rivers was, was uh, obviously very fond of you and, uh, and I think you've, you've worked with and known so many extraordinary legends. 
I mean, I've seen pictures of Lady Bunny with like Bjork and you know every every possible superstar that I consider my you know my kind of level of heroes. A lot of a lot of people around um, in the kind of mainstream, I have no idea who they are. So um, quite a few times people have said to me, well, how did you know about Lady Bunny? And, and I, just, I just say, how could you not? <laughs> how could you miss her? <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I was approached about the book and I said, you know, because I'm like, <laughs> I'm really not the biggest porn expert, you know, <laughs> believe it or not, I'm not. And so I, I, I said, well, you know, let me take a look at the book. And I do remember growing up with images like this and one thing that really struck me oh, about okay, them <laughs> and this is what I you know some of what I say in the the forward is that these guys were picked because they were beautiful they weren't necessarily good actors they weren't necessarily <laughs> intelligent but it was something for us girls <laughs> you know to appreciate and you know I, I, I sometimes think that with a male dominated um, said a man in a wig. Um, uh, <laughs> you, you know, <laughs> entertainment industry, the guys are getting a lot of eye candy. This is an attempt to bring, you know, not just uh, the story behind them, but some of the eye candy and say, hey, you know, the, 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 I, you know I, I just realized that one day when Nicolas Cage was the top uh, box office draw, I was like, hmm. Tom Hanks and Nicholas Hage may be great actors, but they're not, you know, Victor Mature. <laughs> they're not uh, Tarzan or someone who you would expect to see in few clothes or in, you know, swashbuckling feats, you know, performing, you know, uh, stuff that was really geared to make women swoon and to fan themselves, <laughs> as we do. Well, it's, it's, I think it's, it also opens up lots of interesting conversations and, and um, debates. And I, was, I had my copy at the hairdresser earlier, and, and they were just freaking. For all, all the women were just gushing over the book. Um, Your hairdresser is a woman? <laughs> <laughs> I know, look what she did. <laughs> I didn't know such thing existed. <laughs> this is opening a conversation. <laughs> teach you. Female hairdressers. I never. Um, so there are lots of little details in the book that I could seriously go on about forever. This came to me at the very end, the opening page, where I thought it has to be like a kind of sports sweater from, you know, from back in the day. So we, I'm we managed. rare, all natural. Exactly, and that's what it was. That's what it was, and, and is. The, it certainly is rare. And I chose the most gorgeous picture for Lady, Lady Bunny's intro. Oh, wow. These guys, and the hipsters are definitely uh, posting this on Instagram and stuff wow. already, so that's fun. Um, okay. these, these vinyl lovers uh, relaxing on... Uh, in, in, I, I, the best I could do with finding out about this image that it was shot in LA. That was, that was the closest I could get. And it must have been the 60s because of the amplifier. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then, oh my goodness, this oh, wow. amazing image, this extraordinary photographer. She's the only woman photographer in the book. Um, and she's someone who will actually be coming to Books and Books, I'm, ha I'm happy to say, in April. She shot the most amazing photographs of um, uh, the disco era in New York. When was that taken? This was um, 1979. It looks much more um, recent. Exactly. So for me, this was like, this was the turning point image. I put it up front because it has a woman in it and it's the disco era. So this is kind of, you know, unrelated to the rest of the book. It's a woman, yeah. Her name's Meryl Miser, and you should definitely, when she's here, come and, s and, and hear her talk, because she got the most incredible images. She was at all the clubs. She got, uh, she lived in, I'm not sure exactly where, but she spent a lot of time in Bushwick, which looked like, um, you know, a, a complete bombed uh, city at the time. So, yeah, 
Yeah, so definitely look out for her. And this guy is an extraordinary photographer, little known, um, from Havana, called Carol of Havana. And I love this guy. He's gorgeous. And uh, he also shot a lot for um, gymnastics publications, which uh, some of the images are just breathtaking. <coughs> um, <laughs> I'll say. <laughs> Okay, let's take one more question. Um, my question, my question is actually, um, what are some of the memorable challenges that you ran across when you were doing your research, and how did you resolve them? Memorable challenges. There were many, a lot more than I expected, um, with the rights issues, um, and and uh, not all of them were entirely resolved. Uh, if I couldn't um, clear them, I had to say goodbye to some images. And that was hard to do because, um, you know, you've, you spend a lot of time researching them and, and trying to get approval um, for use and trying to convince relatives that, you know, their uncle would really appreciate having his work seen at this point. And then, of course, having to negotiate the realities of a limited budget so my experience was very much similar to the old school um, experience of uh, publishing because that was, you know, obviously a challenge. It wasn't like we were dealing with mega amounts of money at all. So um, it, it really had to be a, a bit of a labor of love um, for people um, as well as, you know, trying to... Uh, uh, there were so many complexities. Um, and, um, you know, so many losses of images because of that. Um, and I do gripe about that in my intro a bit, but it's certainly an ongoing uh, debate that people are having because on one hand, yes, you understand the rights issues, very important, but you also want uh, historic material to be seen. So. Especially if it involves naked men. <laughs> <laughs> so much more interesting than other history, <laughs> I find. We have the book for purchase. If you'd like to purchase a copy of Bee Cake, it's out the counter. We're going to have both ladies uh, signing over here at the table. So we just like everybody to, uh, when you can, if you can, fold your chairs. Make a line if you want to get the books, and let's please give one more round of applause for our lovely <laughs>